Hello, my name is Jason Cooper. I'm at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. I'd like to begin by thanking the conference organizers, as well as thanking you for joining in my talk today. You can find me on the web at jasonkcooper.com, where you'll also find a link to this conference containing references I'll be using throughout. My research is focused on solar fuels generating devices for which this is an example of a hydrogen evolving one created by Carl Walzak. The black slab is a 3-5 semiconducting device stack on which you can see vertical metal lines coated with a hydrogen evolving catalyst. I'll start the video and you'll see that nothing happens until the light is turned on, after which hydrogen bubbles are streaming off at a solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency of 11.3%. In effect, these devices capture sunlight and store the energy in chemical bonds which can be used as a clean alternative to fossil fuels. To achieve this, semiconductors absorb incident light by exciting electrons across the band gap, forming electron hole pairs. Due to band bending at the semiconductor electrolyte junction, electrons in p-type materials are swept toward the surface where they can be used to drive reduction chemistry, whereas in n-type semiconductors, holes can be used for oxidation chemistry. To perform a given reaction, such as water splitting in the last example, the total voltage requirement is 1.23 volts, plus an overpotential that's dependent on the catalyst. For CO2 reduction, however, we require 2.5 to 3 volts, a significantly greater challenge. As we are getting the voltage from the photoexcited carriers, which ideally would contain a photovoltage equal to the band gap less intrinsic losses, the combination of multiple semiconductors is needed to efficiently harvest the solar spectrum. The emphasis of this talk is on newly emerging p-type materials. In my lab, we begin by growing these semiconductors using typically reactive co-sputtering, spin coating, or chemical vapor annealing. We tune the synthesis conditions by testing devices for optimal behavior under CO2 reduction operating conditions. Ultimately, however, I'm really interested in characterization of the material's optical and electronic properties and use a combination of experimental and theoretical methods to evaluate them. The goal is to understand how electronic structure dictates emergent physical properties that may result in limited material performance or be influencing chemical stability. As chemical reactions are under understood to occur on the millisecond time scale, we examine the photocarrier dynamics with ultrafast spectroscopy to understand how synthesis and processing conditions may be influencing defects, but also how the electronic structure might favor polarons, for instance, that trap carriers and limit efficiency. As mentioned, solar fuels generators contain a few key components, semiconductors, surface modifications, such as carrier selective contacts or passivation coatings, interfaces, which are critical to understand as there are many, and typically dictate how efficiently materials will perform, and catalysts, the materials for these applications and discussed in today's talk include copper bismuth oxide and copper nitride semiconductors, copper titanium oxide surface modification on copper bismuth oxide, interfaces at the copper bismuth oxide electrolyte junction, and finally copper nitride derived copper for CO2 reduction. For semiconductors, the materials should be stable under photocatalytic conditions, having band gaps suitable for solar energy harvesting and band positions well matched to the redox potential of target chemical reaction. The surface modifications need to be stable against corrosion, can be used to passivate surface defects, and be carrier selective to electrons to help separate charges before they recombine. The interfaces also need to efficiently transfer charge to catalysts or solution species, not introduce voltage losses, and inhibit undesirable reactions. Finally, catalysts need to be stable, ideally be made of abundant, earth abundant materials with low overpotentials, and drive, in this case, carbon dioxide reduction toward transportation fuel. The common theme here is stable, 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 which continues to be a critical challenge to overcome before solar fuels generators can become functional in the real world. When these ideas are combined on a highly optimized semiconductor like silicon, containing a native SiO2 passivation layer, and a plasma-enhanced ALD-coated cobalt oxide, cobalt oxyhydroxide oxygen-evolving catalyst, the results can be very promising indeed, and under one sun conditions achieve 30.8 milliamps per centimeter squared at 1.23 volts while maintaining a 600 millivolt photovoltage. 
However, for many emerging low-cost semiconductor oxides, the story can be not as promising. Significant progress has been made with bismuth vanadate, an n-type semiconductor, which many of the inherent limitations set forth by its electronic structure and its polaronic transport have been mitigated by doping and nanotexturing, allowing it to reach essentially the theoretical maximum one sun photocurrent density defined by the band gap. Copper vanadate remains a struggle, but has not received as much focused attention to date. In the p-type category, copper iron oxide and copper bismuth oxide are currently above one milliamp per square centimeter in our labs. However, these two are falling short of the theoretical maximum as well. Between copper bismuth and copper iron oxide, the onset potential of copper bismuth is quite a bit better, and as such, we have selected to focus on its development more at this time. As mentioned, we use reactive co-sputtering of copper and bismuth in oxygen-containing plasma to achieve uniform coatings on a 10 by 10 centimeter scale with highly controllable deposited thickness, resulting in films with low diffuse light scattering and allowing for the co-deposition of the same material on FTO glass, quartz, or other substrates of interest for specific characterizations such as TEM or X-ray investigations. The result is a highly uniform coating as seen here by high resolution EDX cross section and SEM with grain sizes on the order of 200 to 300 nanometers. While we did attempt the development of the material initially by spin coating, we discovered copper oxide inclusions at the FTO interface which do influence material performance. As such, we turn to sputtering, which can also be seen in the XRD and Raman as phase pure material. The material contains bismuth plus three and copper plus two ions. The copper is in a square planar geometry, resulting in this approximation of the valence d orbital splitting by crystal field theory. There is one unpaired spin, and as such, we should expect some D to D absorption on the copper site while the principal band gap optical transitions will be from oxygen 2p to empty bismuth 6p or copper 3d charge transfer type. We then probe the optical properties using a unique combination of lipsometry, a custom-built photothermal deflection spectroscopy in instrument which measures absorbed light resulting in heating of the material due to non-radiative recombination and transmission and reflection spectroscopy. The combination of these methods gives us about six orders of magnitude on the absorption coefficient, with photothermal deflection being especially sensitive at low absorbing regimes, where we can see an optical transition due to DD excitations on the unoccupied d orbital of copper. From there, we've developed a nine component oscillator model to describe the optical transitions. Why nine? Because if I used eight, I couldn't get an acceptable fit, but I will try to justify as many of them as possible through a number of other spectroscopic and DFT methods. The absorption of a 200 nanometer thick film is shown here atop the AM 1.5G spectrum, as well as the resulting cumulative photocurrent density, which shows based on the optical properties of this film, we should be able to achieve five and a half milliamps per square centimeter. However, the actual device is operating only upwards of 1.2 milliamps with front side illumination and significantly worse with backside illumination. So what's going on here? To answer that question and gain further insight into the electronic structure, we employed density functional theory with the HSE functional to calculate the orbital characteristics of the density of states. We can see that the valence band maximum is composed of hybridized oxygen 2p copper 3d states with lower lying states comprised of oxygen 2p, bismuth 6s, and copper 3d orbitals. The conduction band minimum is again empty copper 3d orbitals with higher lying states, principally of bismuth 6p character. If we look at the actual orbitals comprising the conduction band minimum, indeed we see it's of copper 3d character. The orbital magnitude in cross section is shown here and suggests a high degree of localization of the conduction band at discrete copper states. Examination of the front and backside illuminated IPCE results shows a clear issue extracting blue light excited photocarriers. As those carriers are generated near the CBO FTO interface in this high absorbing regime, the electrons have to traverse the thickness of the film to react with solution species. In contrast, front side illumination with blue light results in photoelectrons directly adjacent to the solution, thus minimizing any impact from poor mobility of these carriers. These results suggest that the high degree of 
localization of copper 3D orbitals could be resulting in polarons, thus reducing mobility. We can see this very clearly by varying the sample thickness and again comparing the front and backside illuminated photocurrent with a 350 nanometer LED, which suggests that the electron diffusion length is on the order of 45 nanometers. Indeed, this result is supported by investigations from 1996 by Hazara et al., who identified polarons using temperature-dependent conductivity. Here, echoing similar observations in bismuth vanadate, which forms electron polarons due to the vanadium 3D conduction band. The final report on this material is forthcoming and seeks to combine information obtained by DFT, X-ray spectroscopies, and optical characterization, which the unifications of these approaches when fully interconnected is indeed a joyous exercise. Early on in our investigation, we saw troublesome open circuit potential transients. When turning on the light pulse, the open circuit potential change was unimpressive, began decaying immediately, but was partially reduced by increasing the photon flux density. When the light was turned off, the potential dipped negative before returning to baseline. These observations suggested we had significant defects, and we guessed they were primarily related to the surface. As such, we decided to go hunting for a surface coating that would passivate surface defects, be selective for electron transport, but blocking to holes, with a Fermi level that was well matched to that of the copper bismuth oxide, and potentially could impart stability enhancements and corrosion protect protection. The optimistic and lazy thing to do if you have a thermal ALD is to put a TiO2 layer on top and hope for the best. In this case, however, it resulted in a significant decrease in the photocurrent we found through a combination of optical and XPS characterization that the TiO2 had a poor Fermi level alignment with CBO, resulting in a blockage of photo excited electrons. As such, we turned to our partners at Caltech, John Gregoire and Joel Haver, to use high throughput inkjet printing to deposit a library of lanthanum, yttrium, titanium, and copper atop the 10 by 10 centimeter CBO samples. After calcining, each composition was tested by scanning droplet cell, and we discovered that within the titanium and copper gradient, there were some hot spots in performance. With that inspiration, we deposited a uniform copper bismuth oxide layer first by sputtering and annealing in air. Then we sputtered copper and titanium onto that sample without rotating it, resulting in a linear gradient of high to low copper and titanium composition, followed again by air annealing to form the oxides. This was remapped by scanning droplet cell to extract performance metrics across the sample. We were able to obtain the copper to titanium ratio by a combination of X-ray fluorescence and digestion of selected spots with analysis by ICPMS. The takeaway here is that there seems to be a unique composition of copper to titanium oxide ratio that results in improved photocurrent and onset potential. Having identified the ideal copper-titanium ratio at 1.2 to 1, we again fabricated a uniform coating for large-scale characterization by sputtering. The inclusion of this coating increased the fill factor, but not the near saturation current density, significantly increased the transient open circuit potential, and increased the photocarrier lifetime measured by transient reflection spectroscopy from 60 to 120 nanoseconds. These results suggest that the copper titanium oxide passivated copper bismuth oxide surface defects, thereby reducing recombination, while also remaining conductive to electrons. So how's this working? We created sputtered coatings of copper oxide, titanium dioxide, and the ideal ratio to copper titanium oxide, and again determined their band energetics by XPS and optical spectroscopy. After connecting the layers and aligning the Fermi levels, we can again see that TiO2 is blocking to electrons, Copper oxide is better suited for transporting holes, which is also what we observed in that spin coating study I referred to earlier in the talk. But copper titanium oxide had a tailored Fermi level that was well matched to that of CBO, resulting in an ideal conduction band alignment, allowing for electron transport while blocking holes. The last aspect of this study is stability testing. And indeed, there's something interesting going on here that while the uncoated CBO gradually decreased in performance over 120 minutes, the copper titanium coated sample actually doubles in performance after 80 minutes, then starts to decrease. While I don't know why this is, I think this would be a really interesting line of inquiry for future investigations, but might be due to decomposition of the copper titanium layer into metallic copper, 
which is acting as a catalyst. Further investigations into this material system should also include the deposition of metallic copper and testing of the assembled device for CO2 reduction applications. With that, let's move on to a new material, copper nitride. This report published in 2014 introduced me to copper nitride, which caught my eye due to the low optical band gap at 1.4 electron volts, great mobility, especially compared to those pesky polarons and oxides, and a very nice parabolic band structure and thus a low effective mass contributing to this high mobility. I couldn't resist and started trying to make it. We fought for a while with the liquid ammonia electrodeposition route, which while it was fun dissolving metallic potassium and liquid ammonia, it didn't pay off in the production of quality materials. That is until we learned of a, a method reported by Kosuke in 2018, in which they exposed metallic copper to a mixture of ammonia and oxygen at a 70 to 2 SCCM ratio at 550 Celsius, which results in a color change of the metallic copper to green, which is copper nitride. This is really fascinating as copper nitride is totally unstable at process temperatures in argon and air above about 200 Celsius. But in this unique gas composition, it can be formed at process temperatures up to 550 Celsius. We got really interested in how this works and designed a gas delivery system to a reactive oven inside of our XRD to measure the crystallography during thermal processing in this gas mi mixture. Interestingly, we noticed here that the material isn't actually formed as we heat up to 550 C or soak at 550 C, but rather forms as the material cools down to 450 and 400 Celsius. Using a thin film copper sample of 200 nanometers, oftentimes we could see metallic copper at the back contact with green copper nitride on top. This got us thinking that if we thermal cycle the process between 450 and 550, for several loops, we can convert more of the metallic copper and improve the material quality. As such, we developed what we call a sawtooth heating mode. And in comparison to the continuous heating mode, results in larger grains and improved grain quality. To date, there had been no reports of photoactive copper nitride in the literature to the best of my knowledge. The reason seems to be related to having metallic copper inclusions or copper interstitial defects. This sawtooth heating, however, gave us the first significant glimpse of photocurrent, albeit with a significant amount of dark current. What's noteworthy here is that we also cannot drive to very high reduction potentials as the material starts to reduce back to metallic copper. After this dark reduction wave, you can see the significant decrease in photocurrent. We think that's due to the formation of metallic copper inclusions, again, that kills the photocurrent. We've been able to probe the optical properties of these layers again by photothermal deflection spectroscopy and find an indirect gap at 1.48 electron volts and a direct gap at 1.82 in good agreement with the literature. In the PDS spectrum though, we can see significant band tailing due to defects which need to be addressed further by refinements to the processing methods. The absorptance was again used to calculate the theoretical maximum photocurrent density which for this sample would be 14.6 milliamps per square, square centimeter, which makes this a really interesting and exciting material in terms of light harvesting performance. We've investigated the photocurrent density as a function of illumination intensity up to a 9.4 suns equivalent and found a subunity response in the power lock fit, further suggesting we have to work to eliminate intrinsic defects. However, we also need to work to find ways of improving the material voltage tolerance. Again, if you apply too high a voltage, the material is driven back from copper nitride to metallic copper. This particular sample was a piece of metallic copper foil subjected to continuous thermal processing conditions at a reduction potential of minus 0.6 volts versus RHE. After about 10 minutes, there is a current transient that settles as the material is converted to metallic copper. This transformation was confirmed by in situ extra absorption and XFs. This sample of copper nitride on copper foil is imaged by high resolution TEM and EDX after being subjected to the electrochemical reduction at minus 0.6 volts in 0.1 molar CO2 saturated cesium bicarbonate electrolyte transforms to a highly roughened and mesoporous metallic copper layer atop the metallic copper foil. 
This transformation process involves a significant volumetric contraction of the material. As the lattice nitrogen is eliminated, uh, thereby forming this highly porous uh, structure. As it turns out, this highly roughened and mesoporous copper nitride derived copper is quite good for CO2 reduction applications. The voltage behavior of the catalyst shows a high efficiency for C2, ethylene and ethanol, as well as C3, propanol, virtually no methane, and very little carbon monoxide. The C2 plus Faradaic efficiency was 68% at a current density of about 18.5 milliamps per square centimeter at minus one volt versus RHE. This work shows significant improvements to the C2 and C3 products as compared to electrochemically polished copper with a reduction in hydrogen. In comparison to other state-of-the-art catalysts, is not as good as copper nitride derived copper nanocubes in C3 performance, but does have significantly improved C2 plus to C1 ratio. Likewise, the, cop the 100 cycle ALD copper catalyst shows similar C3 performance, but again with lower C2 to C1 ratio. Building on prior work by Alex Bell, the C2 plus product ratio we found was a function of sample electrochemical roughness as these samples reach as high as 20. In conclusion, I have shown a few examples of my group's research approach that really starts and ends with synthesis, with the goal of realizing high efficiency solar fuels generating devices. I showed two examples of the growth of semiconductors copper bismuth oxide and copper nitride, with a surface layer of copper titanium oxide for CBO, which passivated surface defects, was selective to electron transport, increased photocarrier lifetimes, and potentially improved stability. The combination of optical, x-ray, and DFT methods provided deeper fundamental insights to the optoelectronic properties of these materials, while providing justifications for issues related to low mobility polarons. The development of copper nitride relied heavily on in situ characterization to understand formation mechanism, which led to the development of the first photoactive material. Ultimately, the design and optimization of these materials and devices will rely on future studies on photocarrier dynamics, including characterization of bulk and surface recombination, as well as charge transfer across interfaces to drive chemical catalysis using sunlight. Finally, we, will, we looked at the aqueous CO2 reduction catalytic performance of copper nitride derived copper, which exhibited state of the art performance. Finally, I'd like to wrap up with some key acknowledgements. Mohammed Abad was responsible for the development of copper nitride, has been a fantastic postdoc, and will be on the job market next year, so keep your eye out for his CV if it comes across your desk. The copper bismuth oxide project was led by Zerman Zhang, a graduate student at the time and now a young researcher at Lanzhou University. The discovery effort of copper titanium oxide was led by Joel Haber and John Gregoire, with DFT calculations performed by Sebastian Rios Leong. The copper nitride derived copper for CO2 reduction was in partnership with Alex Bell and Kun Zhang, now at SJTU. Please check us out at jasonkcooper.com and find references and links from this talk at the Fall ACS meeting page. Finally, thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'll look forward to fielding questions at the forum or via email. Take care.